What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. It is Monday morning, which means we are going behind the business of fantasy football. We've got a fantastic guest on today, and I want to preface this by saying I know we've had uh, we've had a lot of phenomenal guests on the show so far this season. Uh, for a lot of you guys that just started following the series this season, um, which are probably a lot of you because you know the guys that come on have big followings, they end up sharing it, and then some of the people you know, end up coming on, but I've been doing this show now. This will be the third year, the third season of this show. And when I started off, um, for those newcomers also, the business of fantasy football has nothing to do with player analysis, no team, no coach, nothing like that. No Debbie talk, no dynasty talk today. We're talking only about the marketing, the social engagement, the advertising sponsorships, things like that, the behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry as a whole. And this is something I've been deeply passionate about for a long time. And I thought it'd be fun to talk to some of the people that have innovative ideas behind those subjects within our industry. And when I first, first started off this series, the point of it was to show people not only that side of it, but to hopefully inspire a lot of people by bringing on a diverse group of guests that came from all over the place, no matter what they were doing, if they were big on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, if they did blogging, video, whatever it was, audio to show people that there are a million ways to get to where those people were, the successful people within the industry, and to inspire y'all to do so. Uh, and, I, and again, I know a lot of the guests that have come on this season in particular are very big, and it seems like it's more of like a, a background interview to kind of uncover how they got to where they are. But I think today's interview with my man Ray is going to be extremely helpful to y'all that are getting into the industry or are trying to start something or are looking to break in and are kind of on the ground floor level because Ray is, uh, I don't want to say new to the content game, but new in terms of the people that have been on uh, the show this season so far. So Ray is going to be able to go through a lot more of the pillars that are relatable to most of the audience right now. If you're looking for that extra push, that extra little motivation or tips and tricks on how to start some of the difficulties that you run into when you are beginning, whether it's podcasting or YouTube. So without further ado, we got my man Ray GQ at Ray G Q U E on Twitter. And he's got his YouTube channel up and running, which we will get into Ray. Welcome to behind the business of fantasy football. Are you ready to kill this? Man, so excited. I appreciate you having me on, Nick. Respect what you do. And uh, excited to provide some insight, like you said, from uh, a newer content creator in this industry and in this space. So, man, I'm, I'm ready to roll, man. Let's do it. All right. So, Ray is basically the team lead over at DLF Dynasty League Football for anything Debbie related. For those of y'all that don't know what Debbie is, that's basically a form of fantasy football where you take college football players into account. So I believe you could draft them freshman, sophomore, junior year, and they will eventually make it to your fantasy football team, of course. So it's, it's just a little bit more in depth and a little bit more college centric than your normal fantasy football league. He also has his own podcast, Destination Devi, and the YouTube channel, Destination Devi, which he does a phenomenal job on. This is someone that I wanted to bring on because his core values behind the content that he puts out is something that I really admire and it was, you know, it, it's something that relates to me. And it's, it's um, just, just focusing on giving the best possible value to your audience. And everything good takes care of itself in the background. And that is what I see Ray's brand really being about. So, Ray, as the, the team lead over at DLF and, you know, starting up your own YouTube and your podcast and things like that, give us a quick background of, you know, how long you've been in the content game, how you got to working with DLF, um, you know, Destination Devi, what you guys have planned over there. And, you know, just a quick uh, background for the listeners that may not know who you are. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it hasn't even been a, a true full year. Um, Damn. May of 2019, May of 2019 is when I really kicked off content creation uh, with Destination Devi. That's, that's sort of when I, when I start tracking it, right? When I started the podcast and really, tried to focus on doing it on a, on a really a level for consumption for consumers. Right. So I'd say it's not even been a year, man. And it's happened like a whirlwind dude. Like I've been with DLF shit, six, seven months now and, and been active on Twitter a little more than a year, but actually content creation, man, I'm not even at a full year yet, dude. So it's, I'm still very much new in the game and I'm proud of that. Like I don't, I'm, I, I'm not some longtime veteran in the content creation game. I've 
played fantasy for a long time, but as far as doing this in this space and, and trying to build it and do it the right way, shh, I'm not even 12 months in, man. Bro, I love that mindset. You feel like you're just starting off. I feel like I'm like four or five years into this shit, and I feel like I'm just just starting off right now. And like, I'll never lose that grind to keep going and try to hit that next pedestal and next pedestal. Uh, so you're not even a full year in. That's pretty wild. I figured it went a little further back than that. I know you started your your YouTube channel about six months ago, but dude, you're you have been absolutely uh, dominating Twitter. And you just okay. So the Destination Debbie podcast was completely your own. You started that by yourself. Yeah, yeah, that was completely my own idea. Started that on my own, and uh, it it was not a quick process. Like there was a, <laughs> I've got a notebook, dude, that I can show you. I went through every single fantasy football podcast that was on Apple that I could find, and I wanted to know when they started from their first episode, how many episodes they were doing per week, how long they were, did they go through co-host? It was like a two month process for me to even begin that, and uh, it was. You know, but that's that's sort of my mindset, man. I'm organized. I'm strategic. That's what I do for a living. So, yeah, Destination Debbie was all me, just cranking that out by myself. You could tell that you're an organized dude. I, I could tell right off the rip when I listen to a podcast or watch a video of people in our industry who puts in an incredible amount of research and organization behind the pieces of content they put out. And that's one of the easiest things to understand about you. Like even the uh, videos that you're dropping about, you know, who to take at the one-on-one in these different drafts, the, the shorter form videos that you're doing, I'm sure those take you a, a long time to write up and make sure that you have an organized plan for those and to get those out and stuff. So that's one of the things I really appreciate uh, about the, the content that you put out. So let me ask you, when you said, you know, you did a lot of research for when you were starting, when you did, when you did find maybe pillars of how you want to do your content, like, you know, picking different pieces of I, that's, this is something that I've definitely done throughout the years is finding content creators that I really appreciate and, and, you know, picking out things that I think they do really well. And then putting that into my personal content. Cause I don't think it's like a matter of stealing. It's just like, you know, inspiration comes from everywhere. Most people don't start. They're never like the first one to do something. And if they are, then I mean, good on them, but that's only one person in every part of the aspect. So it's like, you always have to be looking at creators that you aspire to be take pieces, but then put your own spin on it. So for the people starting, what I would do is something just like, Ray, if you want to do a YouTube channel, if you want to do a podcast, find the ones that you really enjoy and nitpick, like, what is it exactly about that podcast that you really like? And I'm talking down to like the very, very minute details of it. Like I like the way that his background is set up. I like the way that he starts within the first 30 seconds. He says the value prop and like one weird fact about the player or something like that. Like find weird, really intrinsic things you like about it, then put your own twist on it. That's one of the things I would say for people, um, for people starting out. So maybe talk about some of uh, the inspirations that you pulled while doing your research. Cause you said you listened to a lot of them. Were there, were there any um, particular podcasts or hosts that stuck out to you the most and were like, Ooh, I really like what this guy's doing. Um, I think I'm going to kind of develop that into my content. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and you got to understand when I was doing this, I said that I'm going to do it. Like when I first had the idea, I was like, maybe I'll have a co-host, you know, maybe I'll have a co-host and then he and I would do it together. And uh, I just, you know, in, in talking to him and, and it wasn't like a close friend. It wasn't, it wasn't a close buddy. It was just somebody that I kind of knew in the fantasy space. And I'm really, you know, no shade to him, but I'm glad that I just said, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it on my own. So my sort of motivation and inspiration uh, was JJ Zacharyson because he does a phenomenal job of a, of a solo podcaster. And it, you got, when you're trying to do something by yourself, a solo pod, nobody wants to fucking listen to one person talk for an hour and a half for 60 minutes. Hell, damn near, let alone 30 minutes. So I but, said, but, I love but if you could pull that off, you, that is, that is so much more, uh, rewarding to the audience. Like the audience loves you and that's, it's sorry to cut you off, but yeah, I, I, no, I was the yeah. same way in the beginning. I was like, I, the the reason I think I was asking you what your inspirations were or like, because when I started, it was just a feel thing. I didn't really do any research. I was like, this is exactly what feels right to me and I'm just going to do it. So I want to know like the battle between, you know, what was it more of a feel or was it really like analytical and shit like that? But yeah, I, I agree with you, man. The one person co-host thing was just felt so natural to me. And I was like, this is how I connect with my audience the best. 
Yeah, and that was me, man. And JJ does a great job of doing it. And mm -hmm. he has little tricks that he does inside his show to break up the monotony, right? So it's not just, you know, 20 minutes of him talking. So he was really my inspiration for saying, okay, I can do this. I know how to do it. And, you know, it's trial and error too, dude. Like, I didn't get it right the first time. The first 10 times I didn't get it right. Mm -hmm. But he was the sort of the pillar that I looked at to model my show after it was JJ in his late round quarterback podcast. Yeah. Uh, JJ does a phenomenal job. He's someone that has pulled off the one person show successfully. I was actually thinking about reaching out to, uh, to him to actually, to have the, have him on this show. Uh, I've only got a couple more weeks left because usually I cut these off as soon as the NFL draft happens. And then we're full steam ahead for, for redraft and dynasty content after that. And we'll save it. I like doing this as off season content, but you know, maybe I'll extend it because the off season might be forever until 2021. So right. we'll have to see, you know, we'll have to stay tuned right. for that one. Um, but yeah, it, it's cool to hear. So again, like for the guys out there that are looking to start, find some inspiration, man. If it's me, if it's Ray, if it's JJ, just, just do a little bit of research, figure out what you like, take bits of it. That will help you uh, along the process. Cause you are going to fail. You are going to fuck a lot of things up at the start, but if you can skip a couple steps on the way there, that's just going to save you some time in the long run. So yeah, that's uh, a lot of good pieces of advice there. So as I said, I mean, you've grown very, very, very quickly on Twitter. You're not even doing content for a year now. And you're almost, uh, I think you, you probably almost have more followers than I do, which is fucking amazing considering when you started. I think you're almost at 9K right now. Now I want to, I want to, pick your brain on on why you think you've grown so quickly on Twitter there is there's an aspect to it the fact that our industry in itself is is very seasonal and the fact that our industry in itself has just so much engagement tailored within it right like if you're in the fucking car industry or the electric industry or the plumbing industry or whatever there's just not any social engagement involved so with our industry people always want to talk they always want to find new people to get value from so there's that side of it but you also do a phenomenal job of tailoring your content to Twitter and making sure that you're giving out value. So do you think for you, it was just like right place, right time? Do you think it was the industry itself? Do you think it has to do with, you know, the fact that, that you've been able to grow during, you know, like the off season is what we would call it in fantasy football is incredible because you're only going to grow exponentially once like June, July, August hits. So like props to you on being able to do that. Cause that's like, the fucking Da Vinci code over here, trying to figure out how to monetize and, and grow during the, you know, January, February, March months. But that's, you know, you're a Debbie guy, you're a dynasty guy. So that maybe comes natural. Like what, what do you, uh, what do you think about why you grew so quickly throughout the off season? You know, this was a tough question uh, when I read it, Nick, because I think it's a combination of things. I always think, you know, of course, I think right place, right time is a part of it. Right. I think, you know, the Twitter threads and the videos, all of that is, is a part of it. But there's a ton of fucking people that put out threads and videos and, and all of that. If, if I had to really focus it down to one thing, I think it's, it's, it's A, not burning bridges, right? I try very hard not to, to burn bridges at this point in, 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 my, in my career, right? But I think it's authenticity, man. It's authenticity and it's quality content. I think going out there, being me, doing it how I want to do it, not giving a damn what people think, um, how I sound, because that was something I was very, very self-conscious with when I, when I first started. I was super self-conscious about uh, how I looked, how I spoke, what I said, how I said it, and it finally clicked. And one day, I literally, dude, I woke up and I was like, they're going to get fucking Ray and it's going to be me. And I don't care if people love me or hate me, but I'm going to be me. And I think that authenticity, the genuineness, and then providing quality content, Nick, I think that has really helped me out. And of course there've been people along the way, right? There have been people along the way that have helped me out, um, that have given me a boost, but they wouldn't have done that had, had I not been putting out quality content. I am a firm believer in, a lot of people talk about luck and all of that. I think you create a lot of that shit too. When you are putting in the work, when you're grinding, when you're putting out quality content, a lot of things seem to open up for you and you create your own luck. And I'm a big believer in creating my own damn pathway. And I think a big part of it is me just being me, though. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that sentiment at the end there. I, uh, I wrote an article, maybe like, uh, I think I released it maybe on New Year's Day or something. Uh, like the 14 
biggest lessons I've learned over the last decade, as soon as the new decade came around and hit. And I think one of them was literally like luck, like you luck is not a thing. Like you, you literally create your own luck by putting in the work, putting in the foundation and by giving yourself this many chances, like, yes, eventually some luck might hit you, but you put yourself in a position to have the most amount of opportunities in order to get lucky. So that's the way I look at it. It's like you, you really create your own luck. Like you want to be more lucky, work more, put, put more hours in, do better work, be more efficient. Like that is how you become more lucky. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the authenticity thing. I think that's something that we're seeing a little bit more and more from the content creators within our space. But I think that's the easiest way to grow an audience and connect with an audience because I mean, if you're not being authentic, then none of the connections that you have within your audience and the brand that you're building are, are real, man. Like that is like, I, that needs to be like the number one, two, three and pillar, no matter how good your fucking content is, like authenticity needs to be a part of it. Otherwise you'll never hit a scale that you're looking to hit. So authenticity for sure. Uh, really good content of course has to be there. And listen, I mean, there are some people that, uh, simply, I don't, I, I mean, I don't want this to sound harsh, but like, there are some people that just, that just don't have it. You know, there is an X factor there. Like you do have to be good. You could be authentic. You can put in a lot of hard work, but there's, there's something about this intangible to it. I'm not to this day. I really don't know exactly what it is, but there is a factor. Of, I don't want to say talent because I think talent is overrated compared to consistency and hard work, but I think there is something there beyond authenticity uh, beyond the work, beyond whatever it is you're doing that people just pick up on quickly. I think it might be, I'm, I think it might be like the charisma. I think it might be the energy that you give off. What do you think about that? It's you, it's a hundred percent though. I mean, it's, it, and you have it, you have it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to sound cocky. I have it. I yeah, know I have it. You know, you have it. You know what I mean? You know, you yeah. have it. Yeah. And then you can recognize that I, I see it in the community all the time. Some people just have it, the charisma, the energy, the enthusiasm that makes you gravitate towards them. And I use this example, dude, and I'm so excited to talk about it with you because I haven't talked about it with anybody else. There's a reason why when I wake up during the week, I turn on Fox Sports 1 to watch Undisputed with Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless. And it's not because of what the hell they're saying, right? It's Shannon Sharp is entertaining as hell. Like, mm -hmm. I just want to watch that guy talk. And I see it with you, man. Yeah, you put out quality content, absolutely. But I want to fucking hear Nick. And I know it's the same way with me. I know people want to listen to me. I know that. And I don't take it for granted. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not cocky about it, but it drives me to continue to put out good content because I know I have that, that charisma and that energy. And it makes me want to do better for the people who consume my content. So I think you're a hundred percent right, man. It's, it's not just, it's not just working hard. It's not just having the quality content. You, you have to have some other it factor that makes people want to tune into you. Yeah. I think it's probably a, bl a blend of like passion. I think when you combine authenticity behind passion, <laughs> when you behind authenticity behind passion, it's, it's just like, it brings out an energy in you uh, that you share with other people and they immediately know they're like, yeah, I don't even know what he's saying right now, but the way he's coming across with it makes me want to hear it more. It makes me want to believe it. it makes me believe in the person, uh, himself. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors that blend into doing it, but the, one of the reasons I brought you on the show is because you don't come across a lot of content creators that really have it, that, that it jumps off to me. And you were someone that I just discovered like very recently. And I was like, Oh, this kid, you know, mm -hmm. this guy, he definitely has it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of good stuff there. I do want to uh, backtrack a little bit because you said like for work, um, you know, you have to be organized. Now I don't, what, what do you do outside of content creation full time? Like a, as a job? Yeah. As my job. So my official title, senior director of development. So for a long time, man, I don't, I don't know if you know this, Nick, but I went to law school, dude. I wanted to be uh, an athletic director. So I worked in collegiate athletics for about eight years, uh, working as assistant and associate AD and then I finally transitioned to a, a, a senior administration level uh, at the university here in the great state of Texas, where, I mean, everything that comes in, like I work with attorneys, I work with uh, big time oil men as far as bringing in funds to the university. So I tell people I'm a professional bullshitter, <laughs> being a lawyer to Aren't uh, we talking all, though? to people about, and, and I've learned a lot from them, man. I'm talking to people who have, and I'm not shitting you, dude millions and millions of dollars and they're trying to, to help out their alma mater. So 
that is my number one role and just listening to them and their business mind and how they got to where they got and learning those stories. I'm just, I'm soaking it all in. So uh, development at, at a university here in, in Texas, that's what I do full time. That's pretty sweet. So the University of Texas? No, not the University of Texas. I'm out here in the, in the DFW area. So uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And you also play college ball, correct? I did. I sure did. Yeah. Uh, played at a, a small Division II school in Nebraska, uh, Shadron State College. And for those of you who don't know where that is, Danny Woodhead and I were a part of the same recruiting class. So uh, know Danny Woodhead very well. And you guys who play fantasy, you know who Woodhead is, man. Hell and, yeah, uh, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know who it is. Uh, I was actually uh, committed to Boise State coming out of high school and then got into a bunch of bunch of trouble, man. I was a knucklehead a little bit. And but luckily, the coach at Boise knew this coach in uh, Shadron, Nebraska, and they wanted to pay for me to go out there and play and go to school. So, yeah, I did that for a couple of years. And uh, being the, one of, like, four black guys in Shadron, Nebraska, I got fucking sick of that. So then I transferred to Houston, Texas, and uh, had a little more fun for the, for the last couple of years of undergrad. I just was sick of it, dude. Like, I didn't want to play anymore. I was tired of waking up at 4.30 in the morning. Like, I wasn't – I'm playing D2 football and it was like a full-time job. You know what I mean? And I just wanted to party, uh, have fun. You know what I'm saying? Do I stuff you, like dude. a regular college student. So I was just like, screw this football thing, man. Hey, nothing wrong with that, baby. We're all, yeah. we're all trying to have a good time. Out here, so <laughs> yeah, man. That's cool. And uh, as we see some of your, I, I think your family members are, are popping in and trying to open the door. They want in on the conversation, I, I, yeah. I assume. Uh, so that was, I want, my, I want, that was my son, man. Authenticity right there. I'm in the toy room. So, hey, I'm, I'm grinding, <laughs> man. I'm in the toy room right now. I love that. I love that. So, let's, yeah, let's talk about the family because, I mean, you're someone who you put out a lot of content, man, and you have a full-time job and you got, I mean, we talked before the video, you just closed on or you're about to close on, on this house and you put the down payment down, but like you can't have people coming in and out of your house now with the whole quarantine thing. So, you got a lot of shit going on, case in point. Like, I want to talk <laughs> about, you know, because... A lot of people in our industry are, you know, people that have families and have a lot of stuff going on. So this is the point of this series to show you that, like, no matter what you got going on in your life, how much shit you have and how many priorities you have, like, there are still people doing it. So if there are people doing it, there's no excuse for you not to do it, especially in a time like this when you have time to start something, start a podcast, start a YouTube channel. And as always, if any of y'all need help doing that, you are more than welcome to hit me up on Instagram or on Twitter or DM me or fucking Gmail me, whatever you want to do. So Ray's got the whole family thing going on. Uh, you live with your wife and you have how many kids? Uh, two boys, two boys. Two boys. Okay, so uh, one, how, uh, wh what did your wife think when you were like, I want to start making a podcast, I want to do YouTube videos and things? That I was a fucking nerd. Like, are you serious? <laughs> you, you really like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? But she was uh, in all seriousness, she was supportive. I think she, I don't think she even knew what the potential of this could be. So she was just like, whatever, go ahead. Yeah. I think she probably thought it was going to be like a little hobby every couple of weeks. I would just talk in a microphone and be done with it. But I can tell you that she did not think that it would get to this level. Um, but she was supportive and she gives me my time and my space to do this. But, um, there's still a lot of time management stuff. You, you, you've got, hell, you got to be organized in life in general running a business. But when you've got somebody else that you got to, you know, you got a whole damn family to take care of, it's even more so heightened and elevated. So uh, she thought I was a nerd. She thinks we're all nerds, but she's supportive of this nerd, you know, nerd stuff, man. I mean, we are all nerds. There's no fucking argument about that. But the good thing about, <laughs> about today's world and how social media is set up is the nerds are winning, bro. The nerds are winning this yep. battle. It's, it's a good time in the world to be a nerd. So it's cool that she was supportive on that. Now, obviously, you've taken that to another, another level, I'm sure. Uh, now that you're seeing a little bit of traction, what are you just like showing her like, oh, look at the Twitter following I have right now. Like this shit is serious. <laughs> She's like, okay, right. Okay, right. Do your thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, funny. yeah. She backed off a little bit, man. She's like, all right, I know you got some stuff to do. I told her I was uh, jumping on with you and showed her your, you know, your setup and, and the YouTube. And she was just kind of like, are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you, are you, I'm like, man, I'm for, but it's, it's cool, man, to see it. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun doing this stuff. And I mean, when you first start off, though, like that stuff is, is very, very real. It's not just getting technically set up and it's not just having the content down and being able to be yourself. It's there are a lot of people in your life that will look at this and be like, you're a fucking nerd. And this is weird. Like, why are you doing this? And that's a mental battle. That's that's a very, very, very big part of the things we do. So like, obviously, you were lucky to have someone supportive like that. But I'm sure you have you know, friends that maybe you are not even close with that have opinions on what you're doing. And like, why don't you kind of dive in a little bit on like your mindset on people? Not, I don't want to say like haters and sound like weird and cliche and shit like that, but, yeah. but trying to keep out the negative mindsets, because I always thought when I first started this stuff, I thought the first year was all mental. I was like, the hardest part about this shit is mental and getting away from the judgment of other people. And then once you get past the mental part of it, you unlock a whole nother part of content and being yourself that you're really comfortable with. But then it gets physically tough because now you start to really put the work in and you're draining your body of like hours and hours of late night shit and trying to figure stuff out. So like talk to the people who are just starting out, um, tell them like your experience that you kind of went through with that and maybe any like suggestions or tips that you would have to get over the outside judgment of people. I don't know uh, what you just said, man, is so real. It's so real because that has been, or was my biggest challenge was the mental getting over and it's not haters, right? It's judgment. Yeah. It's friends cracking jokes. It's, are you serious? You're podcast and talking about it's getting over, you know, when my wife would be like, Hey, tell, tell somebody about your podcast. And I'm like, no, I don't like, it's like, I wanted to keep it a secret. Right. Yeah. But starting out, it was, and it's not that I was embarrassed. It's not that I was ashamed. It's the stigma behind this whole business and industry for like, we tend to live in this bubble and, and we're all cool with talking about all this shit, breakout age, dominator mm -hmm. rating, but the outside, like my friends don't fucking do this. That this is not their space. I've got some that are into it, but for the most part, they were just kind of like, dude, you're a weirdo. Like, are you, are you serious? Like this dude this to is this day, some nerd shit. Yeah. Not, not to cut you off again. And I'll probably say that yeah. phrase like 48 times throughout this, this interview, <laughs> but like, I still to this day, like even having a successful business within my, within my channel and shit like that, I still, to this day, again, I'm not embarrassed whatsoever. I'm not ashamed. I never have been, but I still have trouble. You know, when I meet someone at a party and they're like, what do you do? I, I have a, ton of trouble coming out and being like, cause this is my full-time thing. I do content creation. I would never be like, yeah, I'm a podcaster or I'm a YouTuber. I would say like, I'm in, I'm in the marketing field or something like that. And then as the conversation kind of goes on, I would ease my way into it because there is a real fucking stigma in today's world where it's like, the problem is like, I feel like most real people who do it have understand, like when you have the awareness, you understand that the stigma is real, but the people who are like fake doing it and thinking that it's, it's cool, not that it's not cool to do, but like people who aren't really doing it really are the ones who put the bad stigma behind it. And they're just like, and it's tough because I still, again, have trouble to this day, like being like, yeah, like this is what I do. And I know it's really cool. Most people are like, yo, that's, that's like really dope. Like, I wish I could do that. Like, tell me more about it, but I'm never, I hate like being a podcaster or a YouTuber in today's world is just very fucking you think of very cringy people. That's like the first thing on people's mind. And I'm just yeah. like, fuck, I never want to come off that way. Dude, when I went last November, so we do big Thanksgiving gatherings with our family, right? So I'm mm. in the airport fucking like suitcase with my podcast equipment because I was going to Atlanta and I didn't need to miss a show. So I'm setting up in my aunt's office with my podcast equipment and they're all kind of like, what are you doing? What is that? And I'm, you know, it's, it's that stigma behind it, but that lasted all of, you know, like that, that hardcore apprehension about six months. And, and now I kind of don't give a shit, but like you, I still, to this day, it is a mental hurdle that people really don't take into consideration, but that was, that was challenging, man. And still is to a certain extent to this day. Yeah. I, I think a key thing is like, like being able to joke with people, like you said, like, yeah, I had friends crack jokes and I had, I, I was lucky too. Like I had a very supportive family and a very supportive, um, you know, mom and, and sister and, and best friends and things like that. But like the people that want to joke about it, I don't, you know, I don't take it to heart. Like I don't, people that joke about it are the ones that wish that they could be doing it. And that's why they joke about it to begin with. And you have to understand that from, from your side. And I also think if you just don't waver, like if you're, if you know, if you have to get over that mental hump, just, just don't, don't be consistent with your, your podcast production. I think if people are going to start making fun of you, don't give them a reason to 
make fun of you. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to start off, don't miss a show for a year. Don't miss a single damn thing. If you say you're going to come out and do three videos a week, do three videos a week for a year. People will take you seriously. That's the thing about it. If you start coming out and saying like, Hey, I'm going to do a podcast and you put one out. And then like two months later, you put another one out. Like that's when the people are like, how's your podcast going? And you actually feel flimsy about it because you're, you know, you're, you're going to feel yeah. as flimsy about it as you're being flimsy with it. You know what I mean? But, I mean, bingo. I mean, that's, that's, and that's really what it boils down to. And I want it when I said that I'm going to do this, like I was full steam ahead, right? I was like, I'm doing it hell or high water. And that's why I said Thanksgiving with my family in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm taking my fucking podcast equipment with me because I'm not missing a show. And that's just what it is, man. That's respect. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the way you have to have that mind. You have to have that mindset. If you're five years in, you're 10 years in, you're two days in, it doesn't matter. Like the, the way to get over that stigma, I think is just to one, just be able to joke about it with them because under you have to be self-aware to understand that there is going to be a stigma out there to begin with. But two, just like keep going because at, at some point or another, time heals all and time will eventually break that mental barrier that you have within yourself. Now, physically, right, I said after like, you know, a year or so, that's when it starts to get tough physically. But I mean, it could get tough physically way before that, because when you have a lot of responsibilities, I'm like, I don't have anywhere near the amount of people relying on me that you do. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. Like, I'm, I'm just like by myself out here creating content all day, every day. So a lot easier for someone like me. But for you, like, how do you prioritize your time? Like, how do you how do you have enough energy one to deal with the family deal with full-time work and then make sure that every time you come on the podcast, you're given that same charisma that you do day in and day out. Yeah, man. Um, that's tough. That is tough. It's tough for you. It's tough for me. And I think the, the biggest thing for me was learning how to say no to people. That was hard uh, because I wanted to get my name out there. I wanted to be fucking Podzilla and being mm -hmm. all over the place and, and burning shows down and, and being on everybody's show, but I had to get to a point where I just, I told some people, no, I had to start saying no, because my time is valuable and not just valuable from a content creation side. It's valuable for my kids. It's valuable to my wife and it's valuable to reset and recharge myself. So I, I had to just tell some people like, yeah, I don't mind coming on, but it's going to have to be a couple of weeks from now or next month or you know, I can't do it tonight. I'm sorry. I just got home at six o'clock. I cannot be on your show at six. If you can meet me in the middle and jump on at 830, I can do something with you. But it's prioritizing not only what's important in my life, but what's important for the brand that I'm trying to grow. And I do not want to come off sounding egotistical or narcissistic, but it hit me that I was doing some people more of a favor going on their show and promoting their stuff and retweeting all of their content more than it was really helping me out and what I was trying to do. And, and mm -hmm. my wife and I had a conversation and I've just said, you know, my time is valuable. I'm not Evan Silva. I'm not Andy Holloway. I'm not Scott Fish, but my time is valuable for the people who consume my content to make sure that I continue to put out good content and for my family. So I've got to say no, I've got to pick and choose my spots and I've got to figure out what's important in the grand scheme of what I'm trying to build. And it's a lot of late nights, you know it. I come up midnight, past midnight, editing content. And I don't have a team. This is me, dude. I got one other guy, Jordan Richards, who's an awesome guy who helps me create some of the graphics. But I'm recording the show, editing the show, putting it out, typing up the, the fucking blurb in the description box. Like, I'm doing all of that, man. So it's you got to learn to say no. And I, and I have. I learned that very quickly as well. And you brought up a, a very good point in saying that, you know, you appearing on someone else's show is doing them more value than you. And I think that's something that when you're starting off, you need to be very weary of. And I've talked about this on my show a lot because I, I have a ton of kids that reach out to me and are like, you know, uh, I, I would, you know, can you come on our podcast? Can you come on our YouTube channel and things like that? And, and I'm, I'm the same way with you. I'm like, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, occupied with my own content that I'm putting out and the brand that I'm trying to build, but hit me back in April, hit me back in X, Y, Z. And I will come on, you know, I can make a day over the next 60 days, an hour over the next 60 days where I can come on for you. But again, like you said, like you have to be able to prioritize the pieces of content that you put out because all that is energy, man. I talk about this a lot. Like I'm, I'm a big believer in, in energy, but not just energy for like, 
you don't have separate energy tanks for content, for family, for work. Like they're all one cycle of energy that you could only give out so much in a given day. So it's, you do have to prioritize that shit and you don't have to get to the end of the tank every single day. You save some leftover for the next day and to go on. So like prioritizing and understanding that if you reach out to someone, like don't, don't get hard feelings. If they say no, you need to reach out to five, 10, 20, 30, 80 people before someone says yes. Because listen, if you're just starting out, you don't have a value prop to give the other person. You might just find them at a random time, a random place that they just are in a good mood and they want to say yes to it. But like, if you are starting out and you want to reach out to people to come on again, don't get hard feelings about it because we are all as in what Ray just said in a space where it's, you know, you have to prioritize your energy and likewise, like put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand that that person is probably busy. It's not like they don't like you personally right. or anything like that. It's, it's just something that um, you have to think about and, and prioritize when you are creating content. Yeah, and it's, it's, not, it's not nasty, man. I'm not, no, no you're, you're too little for me to come. It's, it's <laughs> not about that. I have, no, I have no problem coming on, but when you're emailing me or DMing me on a Monday and saying, can you come on my show on a Wednesday or a Thursday? I just, I don't have... It's scheduled, right? Like you just said, no doesn't mean no forever. It's just not right now. But hit me back in a, in a couple of weeks. Hit me back in a month. And, and like you said, I will make an hour for you. Like I have no problem doing that. But my priority is destination, Debbie. My priority is putting out quality content for, for my brand, but also not shorting DLF because I do write and produce content for them. So it's, my time is limited, dude. It's, it's limited. Yeah, I hear you, man. And uh, you do a good job of organizing it to make sure that each piece of content you put out has value and is made to the top piece of production that it can possibly be. Uh, obviously, you take this very seriously. And I want to know, we talked uh, for a second before we got on camera uh, about, you know, how deep into the future you've thought about the content game. And now, I mean, you've only been in it for less than a year. So I didn't really start looking at it for a future, you know, uh, proposition for myself until a couple of years into it. But the way that this industry is expanding so rapidly, there's a lot of opportunity to get out there, right? You're, every podcast is sponsored by some company and X, Y, Z and shit like that. So I'm wondering, like, long-term goals for you content-wise, is this always just something that's been a passion for you? Or is this something you could see becoming a full-time gig? Because, you, again, you have a lot more responsibilities than someone like me. You have to make sure that monetarily I could take a lot of risks. Because worst-case scenario, this shit doesn't work out. I can go to a marketing company and be like, yo, look what I built by myself. Like yep. I would be a valuable asset. There's a, I could get a marketing job like that if I wanted to. Right. But someone like you needs a much higher floor in terms of what you bring <laughs> home to the bank account because you have people <laughs> depending on you. So like full-time gig wise, do you have any aspirations to do that? I think so. I, I think the easy answer is sure. Right. Uh, I, I would not be opposed to doing this full time. I am blessed and fortunate enough to be in a financial situation that is good for, for me and my family right now to where I, I don't have to like, that doesn't have to be my sole focus. Mm -hmm. I would love to do this full time if it made sense. And you said that when you started out, it wasn't, you know, you weren't thinking, well, I'm sure conceptually you were thinking like, what does this look like five, 10 years from now? But you had time to kind of figure that out and play with some things and see what worked well for you. I think where we are right now that there's still time, but it's a little bit different, right? It is a little bit different because there are great content creators putting out stuff. So yes, I've thought about what does this destination Debbie, what is, what does this business look like five years from now? And uh, even if I don't do it full time, I've already taken the necessary steps with legal documentation, getting things in place, uh, purchasing things that need to be protected for the business, just in case that is an option later on. So I've already proactively started taking those steps to, you know, this potentially being a full-time gig for me. And uh, I think I've got a little bit of time to figure it out, but it's absolutely something that is, that is on my mind right now. Yeah. And, and you said, um, not to like pat myself on the back here, but you said, you know, you've watched some of these, these episodes and you know, we're, we're giving out free game on the whole business <laughs> of this landscape, right? What, what ideas have kind of popped up in the back of your head in terms of like growing your content space or growing your brand or even trying to monetize? Have you actually put any 
real thought to maybe pen to paper on, on things that you think maybe you could uh, sell your audience or just ways that you could really grow. Yep. And you said something I'm trying to think of the episode. You'll probably, you probably know better than me, but you pretty much were alluding to the fact that you really don't give a shit about your podcast downloads. Like, yes, you give a crap about them. Like you, you want people to download the podcast, but that's not your main focus. Right. And I think for me starting out, I was just so focused on downloads. Like I need my downloads up. I need my downloads up. But when, when I heard you say that and how you've really kind of built your business and your brand, it really got me thinking about going back to the last question, the time, right? I'm spending all day creating, and I haven't done it in a long time. And there's a reason why it's because of you, Nick, uh, but I'm not spending two hours creating a thread on Twitter. It's just, that is not a valuable use of my time where I'm at in my business space, right? I'd rather take those two hours and create valuable, actionable content for YouTube to help the subscriber base, to get more eyes on it, than spend four hours to post a thread on Twitter, dude. It just, it really, this series that you've put on has completely rocked my world. Listening to you and Matt Kelly, listening to you and Andy Holloway, just talk about how you prioritize and go about your business. I felt like I was hustling backwards, man. That's, that's a term that I felt like I was hustling backwards, staying up all night for Twitter. And I've just kind of like, it's important. It's an important piece that I can engage with fans, engage with my audience. But for the business, it's not as important for me to spend five hours creating a thread of DeAndre Swift when there's already 30 other people who do them better than me already. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 100%. I think like people, when I talk about YouTube, people obviously, uh, most people in this space didn't know me before this series because no one took YouTube seriously within fantasy. And I think most people still don't. And I could give a shit less, right? Like I always talk about, I'm way more concerned about my community than I am the fantasy community. Could care less if people within the space know who I am or follow me or any shit like that. As long as the people that watch me care about me, like that's what I'm concerned about. YouTube, it's not even close uh, in terms of the impact that you have on your audience uh, in terms of like platforms. Like I love podcasting. I like the audio bit of it. But for anyone starting off, like, YouTube is so fucking powerful in the sense that one, you get the, the audience gets to seize you and there, see yep. you and there's a connection unlike anything else. But from a technical and back end standpoint, you could do so much with that one video clip. And that's what I think you're probably alluding to as well. You could take the video clip and it will have the same audio as your podcast. You could download that and upload it in two seconds and boom, there goes your podcast. I don't focus on the audio. I don't focus on that. The other stuff for me, like YouTube will always be my core base and that is what I love. And that is what I will, you know, always focus on in terms of putting out really good content but the rest of the shit is all branding and engaging with the fans twitter is all fun for me i do when it gets closer to like the summer i will be, th be throwing out facts on twitter like all day but those are only coming from the research i do for my youtube videos instagram is more like behind the scenes and fun shit and like podcasting is literally just the stripped audio from youtube so yes i i think people underestimate youtube i think it's by far and away the most powerful platform today for content creators, especially in our space. And I'm glad you kind of switched your mindset. But again, that, that's, only, that's only something you could really learn if you're in the space uh, until you fuck up. Like you have to make yep. those fuck ups to understand what you're even talking about. No, straight up, man. And it, 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 it was, a, at first it was a little, I'm not gonna say demoralizing, but I sat back and I'm like, damn, man, I spent a whole year really, like driving the audio portion of it. But what I do think it did, like glass half full, the optimistic side, is it did allow me to grow a base, right? It did yeah. allow me to get noticed because it was good audio. It was, I just could have, I can only imagine if I had some video to go with that audio, right? For, for the year that I'd been doing it. But it did allow me to, to grow a voice in this space, to get a following. But it's a lot harder right now that I'm seeing that the, the struggle with that is transitioning that over to the video side of it and figuring out what works for YouTube because it's, it's a different, it's different, Nick. And, and you have, I, you and I have had those conversations, you know, offline just, and, and I appreciate your realness for the day that the audio was fucked up from stereo to mono, <laughs> mono, just saying, Hey dude, make sure that when you do this, if you switch mics, make sure that happens. Like we need more real people out there to keep it real with you to like, Hey, this is good, but you could always do better here. So 
learning the YouTube side is a little bit different for me. I, I feel like, again, I'm, I had to take a step back and, and start out slow and, and watching how you operate, dude, I have not seen anything quite like it. It's very unique. It's very strategic. It's calculated how you do it, my man. I know <laughs> pat on the back. I know you didn't ask for it. This was not on the show sheet, but I, I am just, you are definitely a, a, a trendsetter, a, a, a pillar a motivation in this space, dude, because how you've done it is, is phenomenal. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm almost, uh, kind of at, at a loss for words, man. I just, again, I, it goes back to just being yourself, being authentic, trying to put out the best shit that you possibly can, but just doing what's real to you. Like everything I put out is as much as it is calculated, it's, uh, it's a feel thing too. If I feel like, if I'm like, you know what, like honestly right now, I don't really like how that looked behind me. I'm sorry <laughs> if that was really loud. Like I was looking at that in the middle of the video and I was like, that kind of shit is, is making things too clustered and now it's better spread out. Like that's how I want to operate. And I don't, I, I always want to keep the audience on, on their toes too. And not because like I want to do that, but because like that's just the kind of person I am. So I never really know what to expect that. I mean, I think that's a beautiful part about video is like, man, you're just talking to your audience. I think people need to do that too, right? When you're doing video stuff, are you talking to your computer or are you looking at the camera? So I've done it both ways and it's, it's a comfort thing, right? So a lot of the times I'm looking at the computer. Right now I'm looking at myself on the computer, but now I'm looking at the camera. So somebody told me, hey, focus more on the camera. Talk to the people, let them feel you, let them see your eyes. That's it. It's, but Nick, it's the same way with the podcast. When I started out, dude, I hated listening to myself. <laughs> I didn't want to, I've never listened to them back. After I edit them, I don't go back and listen to my shows. I'm on other people's podcasts. I barely listen to those. And it was one of those things, looking at the camera, I didn't like looking at myself. It was a little uncomfortable. So I'm, I'm still trying to learn the best way to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm the same way. I'll, I never, I'll never listen to anything I put out. I'll never watch any piece of content that I put out <laughs> unless it was like completely edited by someone else. And I want to see the final product of it, but I can't stand listening or watching myself actually. Uh, but I would say suggestion for YouTube. Yeah. I don't like, I like pieces of content that are tailored for the platform. So when I do my individual videos, which I start ramping up during the summer, and those are definitely the most popular videos on my channel when it's just me talking straight up to my audience, I'm always making sure I'm talking to them. You know, I think that's a big thing. I don't, uh, it's much easier. Like I've done videos where I, where I look at the computer and I talk to, um, I look at the computer and I talk about the stuff on the computer screen, but I don't look at my audience. I don't like that for YouTube straight up. I don't think that's a good uh, plan of attack for people that are focusing on YouTube. I, I don't know why I can't really put the, the reasoning why, but I think again, it goes back to, I'm really big on micro expressions. And I think that's a reason why you, uh, the audience picks up a lot more on who you are when you're actually looking at the camera and stuff. It is a little bit difficult. You have to get used to it at first because again, you're just talking to a fucking piece of equipment, but once you can pick that up, I, I really think that's low key an invaluable piece of being successful on YouTube. Noted, man. Noted. That's, that's game. That's free game that you're kicking <laughs> for the people, man. So, Hey, and I'm still learning. And, and that's another thing. Be open to feedback, constructive criticism, tips. I don't fucking, I don't know everything. I, th this is brand new. So somebody like you who has made a successful business out of this, when you tell me, dude, look at your audience, <laughs> you damn well better believe that I am going to focus and make sure that not creepy, just staring at them the whole time, <laughs> right? But making sure that I engage with the people and not engage with my computer screen. So uh, again, another free tip that I'm open to receiving, man. Cool, man. Yeah, that, that's super important too, being able to pivot. And you talked about how like, you know, you wasted a year or you felt like you wasted a year doing podcasts when you could have been doing video or doing both at the same time. I feel like I wasted my first two years on YouTube. I feel like if I had tweaked like two things that I saw other creators do really well and I was just like, eh, I don't think it's that important. If I had tweaked, it was like thumbnails and titles and shit like that, that I was just like, eh, it's not that important. If I had tweaked those two things, the first two years, I really feel like I'd be at 150,000 subscribers right now. But listen, man, like you can't go back and dwell on that shit. Yeah. You take what you learned from those years, those two years, whatever, understand that you did build the foundation and that over the long run is fucking entirely more important than getting a few quick hundred thousand fucking 50,000 subscribers that aren't really subscribing to you. They're subscribing to some fucking tactic or some trick that you put out there. So <laughs> the foundation is always going to be 
the pillar of everything you do. So uh, respect to that. And yeah, always, always try to take advice from people who have, have done it. And to this day, there are a million people that have done it better than me and will continue to do it better than me. So I'm always looking to uh, improve my shit as well. So let's move on to some of the content in general that you are putting out, right? You're big on the whole Devi side of things. And I explained quickly what that was to the audience before in terms of integrating college into, um, into fantasy football. So for wh- why, why Devi? Was it because you worked at a college? Was it because you played college ball and you're interested and you're just like, you know, um, this is something that I really relate to. So I think it'd be fun to get in. Absolutely. It, it's the personal experience with the collegiate game. It's playing college. It's working <laughs> in collegiate athletics. It was truly, it wasn't something that I just said, oh, he's doing it. So I want to do it. And I want to see if I can do it better. It's like, I'm already passionate about it. Dude, I'm watching college football Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm going to high school games. I've met some of these top prospects that are, that are coming out for this 2020 draft just through my experience living out here in Texas. So it was an easy transition for me to focus on the Debbie area. And lucky for me, it was a very small space. There have, there, there's not a lot of Debbie-focused content creators right, out there right now. And it, it's just a, a match of perfect timing that I could jump in with the background, with the passion, with my experiences in, in a space that was not overly saturated with, with and, and people think about just good content, it's oversaturated with a bunch of bad content too. You know what I mean? So it, it just happened to work out right that my legitimate passion just lined up with a hobby and it, it's worked out pretty well for me to this, to this point in time. So what kind of content are you going to focus on when like the summer months roll around? Because that's, you know, that's when you grow exponentially on YouTube. I'm telling you the last three weeks of August and the first week of September is when you got to have your fucking clickbait titles and thumbnails ready, bro. That, that is money printing season at its finest, bro. So what what are you going to be doing during the summer? It's getting ready for, for college football. It's getting people ready for so you're gonna next focus, year's class. So you're going to focus on, you're going to continue to focus on that. Yep, that's, that's what it's going to be. And there'll be a little bit of rookie talk because I think this year, Nick, and, and we're all going to see it, is a hell of a lot different than any other year because there is no OTAs. There are no mini camps. We don't know if there's going to be a training camp. So people are going to be thirsting for some kind of rookie content. So it'll be a little bit of that, but I'm focused on getting people ready for 2021. So I'm hammering that hardcore over the summertime, man. That's, I'm already preparing for that. Can I, can I give you a piece of, uh, or a suggestion for content yeah. for YouTube? So yeah. you put, you put out a tweet, uh, the other day, the all avoid, all avoid rookie team or prospect team yeah. or whatever. That yeah. is, that's fucking gold. That is a gold piece of YouTube content. Make that, make that video, do it, whatever it is, 20, 30, 40 minutes. Say this, the all avoid rookie team for dynasty football or whatever, you know, the all avoid right, rookie right. team for fantasy football, or you could do it like do not draft for rookie do not draft these rookies in fantasy football right gold that will fucking absolutely kill for seo and purposes like that and then just break down you know the five or six players that you have listed there that is how that is youtube 101 right there when i saw that i was like yo i'm gonna steal this and we're gonna because (laughs) because for redraft during the summer if you go back and look at my my videos we put out videos that were like must draft players must draft running backs and then we have on the opposite do not draft these players do not draft these running backs in fantasy football those videos the numbers they do are out of control. And I'm like, yo, how can we get better SEO on our dynasty and rookie shit? Like that, take that video, take that tweet and make it into a video form. I, I promise you, it'll probably be the most popular video you put out on YouTube. Done, done, Good. done. Good shit. Get that. Done. I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to do a couple of those too. So we will be competing again, but that Love shit was, it. that was, I immediately sent it to, to Mike and Noah. I was like, yo, this is like, I'm going to tell him when he comes on, obviously, but this is fucking gold and we're going to steal this. So that was, Love that was it, incredible, bro. I love that. So yeah, keep thinking about that when you're thinking yeah. about titles and stuff to use for YouTube. Because we see a lot of podcasts like Matt Kelly does it and the Breakout Finder and stuff. They have their podcast names, right? Like each of them are just like random names that they put out for the podcast. And I love that. I think that's amazing for branding. But for YouTube, again, it's a search platform. You put those names on like the YouTube title names and it will do you absolutely no favors. You're not going to get clicks putting up a random weird like, you know, Hakeem right. Butler, fucking Godzilla Right, Tornado, right, right. Whatever the fuck they got going on for titles. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So do that, make that a video piece of content. So I, I would say like, I don't know the college football space that well in terms of, uh, the content itself and you know, how, 
saturated is or what works on YouTube. But I would say like if you're really into fantasy football as, as a thing, I would maybe mix in one like redraft video a week just for SEO purposes, right? Because those will do a couple thousand views and obviously right. that will transfer over to your other Devi videos, which you are passionate about. Right, right. And it's, and that's the hard part, right? Because everything is focused around Debbie. It's in the damn title of my brand, Destination Debbie, 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 mm -hmm. Debbie. But that's still such a small space, right? And I've even seen myself kind of transition into some more dynasty related focused topics because I already know about all the fucking players, right? I've been talking right. about them for four years. So I can recite stats off the top of my head, but really trying to stay in my quote unquote lane but also expanding just enough to appeal to a wider audience outside of just college football heads, right? So that's, that's another part of, of trial and error and learning and figuring out what works best for YouTube, not just what works best for Twitter or for the podcast. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, I think niching down is fantastic. I think that's a great like business tactic. I do think there can be uh, a point where niching down too small uh, can be detrimental in terms of the potential that you can have. And I think like your content is great all around. So if you, you know, this is something I, I've, I've realized like very recently, I'm like, you know, the best way to grow is find your, find your niche, your passion for you, it's Debbie, and then find topics that are really popular that still relate to Debbie and have that as a pillar of your content. So again, like once a week, put out something that's actually just like dynasty related or redraft related. So that will bring in the organic shit and then they'll eventually turn to the shit that you're really passionate about. So that's something right. that I, I've seen recently. And that was something I've always done. Like I've always focused on fantasy, but like I've built an audience through fantasy so that, you know, people can see the stuff that I'm really passionate about, the business, the marketing, the vlogging, the, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes shit that I like to do. It's again, it's calculated in a sense, but it's also a, a gut feeling thing. It always felt like it was right, but I guess I never really put, you know, uh, pen to paper on what it was that I was really doing. And I'm starting to kind of figure that out now. All right. So you started on YouTube about like six months ago, right? Yes and no. I had a YouTube channel about six months ago, but that shit was just random. I was just, <laughs> I, I hadn't even like, I went back. You can't see it now. I was just throwing stuff up, right? No thumbnails, didn't care about titles. So I've had one for about six months, but really the rebrand and refocus was about February. February one or whenever to today was when I got Jordan on board and everything just looks consistent. I'm very anal about how things look when you go to the channel, what's it look like? How does it flow? So about, uh, it's only been truly Nick about like two and a half months of really trying to get that, the growth growing there. So it was, it was a fucking mess before that. I was just throwing random shit up, copyright hits all over the place. <laughs> uh, didn't know what I was doing, but even then with that disorganized, just slop, I had like a hundred and something subscribers just off of the name. Right. So yep. then I was like, let me take this serious and took everything kind of took stuff hit everything reorganized it and then rolled it back out in february yeah bro you're like literally just laying out all the steps i went through like i didn't you know i was just like whatever when i first started as soon as i started taking it seriously you realize how much that shit pays off and i mean you're doing you're doing great for for a, like a february one serious start and you have what 600 650 subscribers something like that you're like you'll yeah. you'll be at the thousand mark in no time and for people starting out like they see these numbers from the beginning and they get intimidated. They might look up to someone like you or they might look up to someone like me or the footballers and see, you know, 100,000 subscribers and they're like, oh, I'm not going to start because I'll never get there. But what you don't realize is these little milestones along the way, like you put out your first video, you get five subscribers. You're going to be just as excited about those first five as I am about my first 5,000, right? It's all relative to where you are in the space. So don't let the big numbers that you see people that inspire you to start something also be a turnoff, right? Like, don't let that be a catch 22 to you. Like, you have to understand it's all relative to where you are in the space. When you get your first hundred, when you get your first 500, like, right, when you hit your thousand, like, you're going to be super fucking stoked. When I hit my, I'll be honest, like, when I hit my next thousand, it's not really going to hit me. I'm going to be like, okay, whatever. That's another thousand in the stack. Right. But like, I'm going to be excited when I hit 40 and I'm going to be excited when I hit 50. I won't be excited again until I hit like 75 and then a hundred, but like, it's all relative to where you are. So those first 10, 15, 20, 50, whatever are, are what it's all about. It's the fucking journey, man. It's about the process. <laughs> that's what, that's what it is. 
Dude, when we hit 5,000, man, I mean, 500, me and Jordan were texting each other, bro, we got 500, uh, 500 subscribers. And for me, dude, it's competition, right? Like, so I've got this other site, I'm not going to name them, but the goal was to pass them up in subscribers by, I think I said by the beginning of the football season, I'll probably hit them before the end of next week. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. was, and they were doing it. And I was like, that's just my goal. I just want to pass them up. By September, it's just the competitive nature in me. But what you just said, I go look at you. I look at the ballers, and I'm like, Fuck, I'm never going to make it. I'm only at 200. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I have not done any kind of gimmicks to get that up. None. Besides telling people to subscribe, right. putting out quality. I haven't given one fucking free thing away. I don't have a website to give you a promo code to. Like, There's some things in the works, but all of this has been organic growth. Just putting out content and asking people to subscribe, you know? So you know, it, it's, it's been a fun journey. And for me, yeah, when I hit a thousand, I'm gonna be stoked. And then it's gonna be 2,500 and then 5,000. And then like you said, once you get to your level, it's 40, 50, 7,500, you know, it's relative. Yeah, exactly. And you got You got to have that mindset when you're starting out. I don't think it's necessarily a switch that you need to have. I just think it's for people that haven't even started yet. If that is something like once you start and you stay consistent with it, you'll realize very quickly that those are the things that you start caring about. And it's not relative to, to me or whoever else you're looking at. And like, you do have to have a bit of humility because when you start out, like even Ray, like Ray has, uh, you know, like 9,000 Twitter followers, but he's getting excited about hitting 500 subscribers. Like <laughs> that's a real thing. Like you need to understand that you know, you're at the back of the race again. Like, yes, you could funnel some of the audience from Twitter over to YouTube and get those numbers up a little bit, but like, it's going to, you, you don't have like one lucky home run that gets you everywhere. Like, listen, take it from me. Like I've had some really big dudes on this channel that have monster follower accounts. Like, you know, the Brad Evans is the footballer, like all them dudes are six figure follower accounts. Those are not like, there's never going to be one thing that you get one guy on here and then shit pops off. That's just not the way the world works. It's about doing it every single day, showing up consistently, putting in the work behind the scenes, being prepared, being organized. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it that, that's, that's what it, it's about. And I, I think, uh, it, this series is really just to help people understand like the real workings behind the minds that you need to have. And all of this magical fucking nonsense that a lot of people probably think is, is happening behind the scenes, man. But Nick, it is humbling, right? Because you can't fucking lie about your subscriber count. You can't, is you, I, I'm going to have 10,000 followers on Twitter before I have 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. And you can't puff your chest out as your big shit. And then you put out your, you go subscribe to my channel and you got 650 followers. Like it is, it is humbling. You are at the, I am at the back of the race, but you know what? I'm committed to it. And I know that this isn't a, a one show thing, a one person episode is going to blow it up, but I'm passionate about it. I believe in what I'm doing. So I'm going to keep grinding. And I know that organically that shit's going to happen and it's going to continue to build and grow, but you got to, Hey, you, you gotta, you gotta know your place in the space that you're in right now. And I'm fine with that, man. I'm happy as hell that I'm at 650 subscribers because I know I'm, my next step is 750 and then a thousand and then let's keep it let's keep it rolling man yeah i love that you talk about like the organic growth i can't stress this enough when you are starting off don't be using those fucking tactics man don't be throwing up fucking giveaways to try to get subscribers because those are like the least depth worthy subscribers you will ever have and it's all about depth over the width here like those 600 subscribers that ray has are probably more valuable than a lot of channels that have 5,000 or 10,000 subscribers. And I mean that like I was, I was out here making good money as a business when I had like four or 5,000 subscribers. And there were people that had five times the amount, 10 times the amount that, that couldn't touch the, the depth of the brand that I was building. And again, I, I don't want to come off like narcissistic or cocky and that shit, but I really mean that when you focus on the right things from the start, from the foundation, building it organically, try to hold on to that as long as you possibly can. You know, I said it, before the video came on, but like the best way to, to pitch things or to sell things in today's marketing world is not it, the less you sell, the more you will sell. Like it, people don't want to be fucking bombarded with, with <laughs> this fucking shit all the time. They will buy because of you. They're not buying because of a tactic that you pulled. They're buying because of the loyalty and the brand that you've built and the connection you've built with them, man. It's fucking, it's a crazy world. And I just feel like fantasy is just up for the taking right now. Yep.
101, man. Another another tip, Nick tip, man. That's that's game right there, bro. I mean, for real. That people in my in my line of work, man, people buy into people, man. Like I can have all this nice, these gimmicks and brochures and all this shit, but ultimately, man, when they believe in you and what you're doing, it it almost sells itself, man. It does. It literally sells itself. It's actually it's insane, man. It, it's the most powerful thing, like that you could do as a content creator is, is tr try to not sell people, only give them value, just give and give and give and give. And the exponential give that they, they give back to you is yep. going to be 30 times more than, than you could ever give to them. And it, and, and it plays itself out naturally over the long run, 10 times out of 10. And uh, you know, you're talking about putting out game right now. And I want to talk about you being a former player, right? So I want to talk about the connection between, this is something I've had on my mind since I started the series and I didn't know who I would be able to ask about this. So, I'm not sure how to even phrase this question or this paragraph, <laughs> but like, okay, so you're, what, what position did you play in football? I played a uh, cornerback, DB. I was a okay, DB, perfect. Corner. Perfect. So we talk about like in Dynasty and Devi, right? You're looking at numbers and analytics, like breakout age, right? And it's something that we've as a community understood now for a little while. Like, obviously it's not a perfect black and white hit or miss based on a specific age, but like as a player, like, imagine you talking about this stuff and you're like, this guy is not going to be a good NFL player because he had a really late breakout age. You telling yourself as a cornerback playing on the field, like imagine you lining up across from a wide receiver and be like, I know you're not actually good because you had a late breakout age. <laughs> like how, how the fuck did you shift? You know, because this is a thing in today's NFL. It's like we got old fucking 70 year old white dudes that are doing that are scouting. And they're like, this guy's a good football player because I've been around football for a long time. And yeah. we have like 25, Five year old Twitter people that are like, no, he's not a good player in the NFL because of analytics and XYZ. Like, how the fuck did you get the mindset shift to go from player view to like analytics view on fantasy football, bro? <laughs> I mean, it's a couple of things, and and you just talked about it. It's my audience, right? I've got I had to conform and change to cater to my audience to a certain degree. To a certain degree, because I still bring some of the player side into it. And if, if I were looking back and telling myself that this wide receiver that I was playing against wasn't good because he was a fifth year senior and he had a late breakout age, I would laugh hysterically at right. everybody saying this. Like, it's just, you're talking about back when I played, fuck, two years ago, I would think it was stupid. You know what I mean? Like, are, <laughs> yeah. are, we, really, are we really basing what we think these players are going to be based off of when they caught 60 passes and 900 yards in a season. Like that's. But now you, <laughs> but now you believe it because the proof is yes. in the pudding. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. But you learn, you learn. I had to open the way that I thought the way that I thought. And just because I played doesn't mean that I had a better, like I was better at one thing over another, right? It gives me a different perspective. Absolutely. It gives me a different perspective because I do know what goes on on the practice field, in the meeting rooms, what we really look at when we're scouting film, but that doesn't make my process the end all be all, the alpha and omega. So I've learned to incorporate some of the things that I learned from the analytical and the data side. And I feel like it helps me be better because now I can give you the perspective of somebody who did play, comma, however, you know, here's some historical data that's hard to ignore. And, you know, whether I agree or disagree, I still take all of that into consideration now. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I just thought that I'd say that you fucking, that's just silly. Like, who, who gives a shit about any of that? I know. Well, that, it's so funny because it's going to be a really prevalent topic in the NFL over the next, you know, five, 10 years, how we're seeing this bash between, uh, older executives and younger analytics teams coming in and people are like, ah, oh, we don't like the analytics, but there's like historical data, as you said, to, to back up a lot of, you know, what people are saying. And it's, it's, uh, it's just a really interesting time. And I'm excited to see how it progresses over the next couple of years. Cause I was like the same way. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I didn't play football, definitely not in college and I didn't play in high school or anything. Uh, and a lot of the analytical numbers, I'm like, this is just like too much. There's no way this shit is real. But like the more you listen to people that know what they're talking about and the more examples and cases of it happening, you know, it's just like, holy shit, like there is really something to it. And it's only a matter of time before people that are higher in the actual game at the NFL level start to take notice of these things. And like, 
when you look at like Warren Sharp, right? Like Warren Sharp is, is, is amazing at what he does in terms of breaking down the numbers and stuff like that. And he advises real life NFL teams and Warren Sharp. And like, he gets together with a guy like Evan Silva. Like this is real relationships that happen. It's only a matter of time between the gaps of our industry and like real life football get bridged. And it's because of the numbers and things like that. So I think we're going in a very interesting uh, direction, you know? hundred percent, man. You, you can't tell me that there aren't NFL teams who wouldn't take some of the information that floats around fantasy Twitter, right? With people creating yards per reception and yards per route run and to it's catch so un- it, the like, industry is so underrated, bro. It's crazy. It really is dude. Like uh, there are people in the industry that I value their opinion of players based off of data and uh, historical data that I value over some curmudgeon 80 year old standing in the box saying that Lamar Jackson needs to play wide receiver. You know what I'm saying? Like a hundred percent. Yeah. There are dudes like straight up the, the, the far, far, far majority of people on, on uh, in the fantasy creation space, I have no idea what they're talking about as far as like player evaluations and myself included. I can never step into a, like an NFL executive office and be like, no, nah, like you should take this guy over this guy because X, Y, Z, but there definitely are people that have legitimate cases to be made for contributing to real life football that have started within our industry. And it's, um, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy, man. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we've been, Oh man, we've been on this call for, for a hot minute now. I think it's, I think it might be time to uh, queue up the final questions. And actually on that note, I want to, I want to ask you what, what, What's the what's the Twitter name? Ray GQ. Is that a spin on like are are, are are you a model or is your is your middle name G and your last name Q? So so here it is, dude. So in college, uh, I'm a part of the fraternity Omega Sapphire. All right, Q Dogs. Okay. That's the that's the nickname, the Q Dogs. Uh, so then my first name is Raymond. My last name is Garvin. So then Ray G. I'm a Q Dog. Uh, so it just okay. worked out. And then I dress pretty fucking fly too. So then it all kind of, <laughs> it all kind of just worked together, dude. Just Ray GQ. And I thought it was just kind of cool. Fraternity, real name, fly guy. I mean, I thought it's, it just worked. It's a fucking killer Twitter handle, you know? <laughs> I, I just like, I didn't know the actual story. But now that I think about it, I've heard, you know, Ray Garvin on the podcast plenty of times. Yep. And I'm just like, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense now. But I had to hear the, the backstory. Okay, That's so. It, man. Let's let's end the episode with a few random questions that I ask all of the guests. The first one, I mean, you have a lot on your plate, obviously, and you're just starting in the content game. But are there things that you are passionate about, maybe other creative endeavors that you could see yourself diving into over the next, you know, two, five, ten years outside of sports altogether, outside of fantasy sports? Yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm just business savvy, dude. Like, I've always been thinking ahead, even back from whenever I was doing – shit when I was younger that was business related that wasn't a real business um I'm just always thinking about you know how to <laughs> make things better or you got, how you to, got caught selling weed didn't you I mean I just I, I didn't say that man I just said that I was <laughs> I was I had an entrepreneurial spirit at a young age right Fair. but I think moving forward uh this creation side of things and i'm not a marketing major right but i see so much shit nick that i just listen to it or i see it and i know that's not it right i'm just like i know this isn't it i'm very good with with the macro like i see the big picture the micro that's why i have people helping me develop and fine tune things but i mean god man i would love to to like real estate i love i love houses right we're we're in the process of 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 purchasing a new home but Flipping real estate, you know, getting involved with that, purchasing property. I really don't want to be a landlord. That's why I said flipping. Um, but that is something that it interests me and my wife. So that is something that, you know, learning how to, to market and promote. I mean, you need that in any kind of business venture. So I think later on in life, a couple of years from now, that could be a real possibility for me. Yeah, you're not the first person that's brought this up on the show. And I I know like real estate is something that I should look into and probably research more and, and, you know, start to invest a little bit more into. It's just, I don't know. It's nothing. It's just something I haven't spent time in. I don't, I honestly, I don't see myself like settling down or buying a house or anything before I'm like 45 or 50 to be real. I think I'll be like renting and moving. I don't like to stay in one place. So like, it's just something that I don't know will ever cross paths in my lifetime or at least while I'm, while I'm young and looking to invest in anything. But yeah, I, I could, I could see, uh, real estate as, as a fun venture to get into, especially transitioning from like content to real estate. You learn so many good, uh, you know, lessons and, and business ideas from this stuff that people might not really think about, but most of them transition successfully over to, you know, an industry like that and just all industries in general. So 
real estate. Okay. Me, and, and let me, let me just say this, dude, one thing that I've learned throughout <clears throat> my professional career and throughout this space, the gift of gab and the power to sell via your oratory skills, talking and speaking and engaging and being able to captivate people that is a skill that will have value from today until the day you die. If you can speak and get people to listen to you, right? Then it's, it's so powerful. And, and we could go down a million different holes, whether that's politics, whether that's fantasy football, whether that's fucking the weed salesman, right? If you can talk and get people to buy into you, Dude, your options are limitless, man. Like, I, I, I truly feel like Jay-Z said it in a line. He said he could sell water, water to a well. Water to a well. Yeah, yeah sure. man. Like, I, I feel like I can do that, man. That dude said he could sell fire in hell. And <laughs> if you can talk and get people to buy into you, man, it, it, is, a, it is an invaluable skill set. And not everybody has that. Yeah, you're right. That shit just gave me goosebumps a little bit, I'm be honest with you. That's funny. Yeah. All right. So, next question. Best purchase that you've made under $100? I'll tell you right now, it was purchasing somebody to create me a legitimate logo for Destination Debbie. That was the best. I did some shit on Photoshop and it was okay, <laughs> right? Starting out, but I knew that when I wanted to focus for real on YouTube and say, I I'm going to create content, visual content, I want a website to go with it. I had to get something professionally done and not just me fucking around on Photoshop. So that was the best purchase that I made. And we went back and forth with the design, but because of the gold DD crown on top, that is just spun off into everything that I do is centered around what that looks like, how it interacts on the page, what it looks like on the YouTube channel, what it looks like on Twitter. The best purchase that I've made was having somebody professionally do my logo. Where did you find someone to do that? Is that from Fiverr? Yep. Yep. And I, I went through it, a bro. couple of, couple of different people to, because it wasn't, it didn't look like I wanted it to look and I wasn't settling and I wasn't, wasn't an ass about it. I was just like, this isn't it. This isn't it. And when I finally got the one that was it, I was like, okay, now I can roll. But that cool. was the best purchase I made. Okay. Yeah. Fiverr was a, a site that I used often when I first started making content for, for those of you guys out there. Uh, it's Fiverr with two R's, F I V E R R dot com. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the premise behind it is basically get anything done for five dollars or less. And now it's it's almost like a dollar store in today's day and age where you walk into a dollar store and nothing's actually a dollar. Like you have to pay three, five, eight dollars <laughs> for shit. That's how Fiverr is now. You get, you know, pay more for more premium shit. But if you're ever looking for like someone to make a YouTube header for you, a YouTube intro for you, that's where I think I I uh I got my intro from it where the guy's like drawing my logo on it. That's from Fiverr. Um, if you want to get a logo done, like anything tech wise that you need done, Fiverr can get it done for you for the cheap. So that's a, a nice little piece of tactical advice for y'all out there that are starting out. All right, Ray, Mr. Ray GQ, last question of the show. One bold prediction for the future of the fantasy football industry. Bold prediction, bold prediction. I will say, uh, and I'm proud of this, man. I'm, I'm very, very proud of this. But I think we're going to see more minorities, man, within this space. And I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that, that I am a change agent for that because there aren't many people who look like me doing this, right? And this isn't some fucking race thing. It ain't about that. But that's just the facts, man. There aren't a lot of, uh, of young, I'm going to use an old term, hip black guys doing what I'm doing. And I take pride in that, dude. I'm a tattooed, weed smoking, gold chain wearing, like professional <laughs> dude doing this, man. And, and I, want, I want other people like me to feel comfortable that, you know what, it's, it's okay to enjoy this passion and do what you do and wear your hat backwards and be tatted up and all that stuff because people are going to relate to people, man. So bold prediction for the future of fantasy. I think you're going to see uh, more minorities in this space and, and we need that, man. You know, we've got a lot of good women. 
There's a bunch of young white dudes doing it, a bunch of old white dudes doing it, but there aren't a lot of people who look like me and I want that to happen. And I appreciate and love everybody, man. But I, I would like to see a little more diversity in the space. Yeah, and I, I, I can guarantee you that you will be a reason why someone out there starts a podcast or a YouTube channel because you're the one pushing that thing. And like that was beautifully said because when I started off, like that was all, that was the reason I started, man. It was like one, because I legitimately thought like 19 year old Nick thought he could help people with fantasy football. I thought I was good. I was fucking terrible at the time, but I thought I could genuinely help people. And that's where it started from. But I also love putting out the, the, the lifestyle stuff that I, that I try to convey on my channel because I wanted to show kids, you know, I started, I started vlogging like literally the day before I left my full-time job. Like the next week was the first vlog I put out. I wanted to wait till I leave. I left. And at that time I was not doing content creation full-time whatsoever. I was freelance marketing. I'm like, yo, this is a, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am. I'm not anyone special. I don't have a huge platform already, but I'm going to show you that if you're like me, if you're young, if you want to just be yourself, you want to say fuck on camera, on video, on podcast, you could do that and still be successful. There's no right way to be successful. There's no way to look there's no way to present yourself the only right way to do it is the way that you do it man and that's what we're out here trying to inspire whether it's race whether it's personality whether it's the way you talk where you come from if what gender you are shit like that man none of that shit matters the only thing that matters is being yourself because everybody can make it if someone like you has made it dude flat out man flat out and you know it's just be you, man. If, if, if this is what you want to do, like we've talked about throughout this whole episode, quality content, having those relationships, being open to criticism, to feedback, and being you, man. Don't try to... I tried to be somebody else. <laughs> I tried to... When I go back, Nick, and listen to episodes one through eight, I hate them because I was trying to sound like JJ. I was trying to sound like somebody else when i just said fuck it i'm gonna be me and do it how i want to do it it just it opened up that's when stuff started to click and i felt like things started to gel together so uh, i that's my bold prediction for the future man i, I really want to see some more people get over that fear get over that mindset get over that insecurity and if you love this and you're passionate about it let's go man and i'm willing to help anybody out there who who has those fears man I love that. Yeah. And, and like I said, man, it's not even a prediction. It's going to be a fact because you're the one pushing it out here and people are, are going to resonate and they're going to start making moves because of it. So, man, this was uh, honestly, I know I, we said it. I said it on Twitter before I said this was going to be a fucking great show. Don't even worry about nothing, man. I knew the conversation would be good. This has easily been one of the best episodes I've had on this series so far. For people that are starting out, man, I really hope you guys got a lot of value from this. I really hope that we could be a source of motivation or inspiration during a time where we have a lot of uncertainty, but also a time where we have a lot of time to start chasing your passions. And I'll tell you what, man, if you ain't going to do it now. You're never going to fucking do it because people want to talk about not having time. It's not about not having time. It's about not having discipline. You can get shit done, whether you have a job, whether you have priorities, shit like that. So listen, it's, it's, it's not about someone handing something to you. It's like you just make the conscious decision to do it or not to do it. I'm glad that you made the conscious decision to watch this video today, man. This was a fucking killer. I had a, a fucking blast talking with you, Ray. And uh, I hope you guys got a lot of value from it. Um, if you did, we just ask that you share it with other people that may get some value from it. Make sure you are following my man, Ray, at Ray GQ on Twitter. Make sure you are following Destination Devi everywhere, the YouTube channel, all that stuff. You can find all his work on his Twitter. Ray, thank you so much for joining me today, man. We're out.